All right, it's five after the full hour. Uh, we wanted to give uh, a few more participants the chance to sign in. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends and distinguished participants in Asia. Good morning to those of you who are calling in from Europe uh, and Africa. Uh, this is the third session of a webinar series organized jointly by the Asia Let's Partnership, a uh, regional platform and the Energy Working Group, which is the work stream of the LETS Global Partnership. Uh, LETS GP standing for Low Emission Development Strategies Global Partnership. Uh, and we will introduce in a moment what the LETS GP is and uh, what the Asia Platform and the Energy Working Group do. Uh, the webinar series we have been organizing together uh, is on innovative tools for advancing low emission and climate resilient energy planning in Asia. And uh, all the three sessions, this is the third one, have followed the same format uh, of first having a tool for LEDs planning introduced and then asking practitioners from individual countries to present on um, how they have used uh, the tool for energy planning in their country context. So we will stay with this successful approach today. Uh, today's session is on gender mainstreaming in the energy sector. I see somebody's moving the slides uh, relatively quickly. Uh, so uh, gender mainstreaming in the energy sector um, and the framework uh, and the applications. Um, before we go to the agenda, uh, could we jump back to slide two please? Uh, there's a disclaimer that's important. One more back please. Yes, this is an important disclaimer because we want to make sure everybody understands that the Let's Global Partnership, particularly as we're talking here about policies and tools, does not endorse or recommend any specific products or services uh, or any, any information that we provide in, in our activities like uh, in this webinar uh, are featured on the uh, Let's GP website so you can find the, the first two webinars uh, on uh, use of uh, energy planning tools in Asia on that website as well, as one of many best practices resources um, that we have reviewed. Thank you. So next slide, please. There are some uh, important housekeeping items. You can uh, listen to us um, uh, using either your computer, uh, in case of which we'll ask you to select the mic and speakers, radio button on the right hand, audio pane. You'll see this. Uh, audio pane on the right hand side, so press mic and speakers there, or you can listen to us by phone, in case of which you please select the telephone option in the display. Uh, and if you press it, then a phone number and the and pin will display that you can use. Uh, I want to remind panelists to please mute, mute your audio devices when not presenting, otherwise we hear the funny noises in your background. And uh, if there are any technical difficulties, you see a number here. Uh, and you can go, you can dial that number and talk to the GoToWebinars help desk to help you with your technical problems. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda for today's session. We're right in the midst already of the welcome and the introductory remarks. I've welcomed you. I haven't introduced myself. My name is Alexander Ox. I'm chairing the Energy Working Group. Um, and uh, I will give you in a moment uh, an overview also what the Let's GP Energy Working Group does. We are organizing this together with the Asia Let's Partnership, which will be introduced to you by Sandra Kananusit um, in just a moment. And then we come to the main and exciting part of uh, this webinar. We will have three presentations uh, from three distinguished panelists, uh, Anja Rojas from Gecko, a product of the IUCN, uh, Soma Dutta from Energia, and Francesco Tornieri from uh, the Asia Development Bank. All three panelists will be introduced uh, in greater detail just before they speak so that you know who they are. Uh, after this main part of the webinar uh, and uh, these fascinating presentations, we will go to questions and answers. We'll make sure that you have enough time to put in your questions, uh, that we take enough time to answer them. And after that, there will be a, a short survey. And I'm really asking you to please stay online and answer the survey, because it really helps us uh, to do uh, better in the future. So uh, with this, I want to hand it over to my co-host, Sandra Kananusik from the Asia Let's GP Partnership. And you will hear back from me in a moment.
Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Sandra Kananusic. I'm part of the Asia LEDS Partnership Secretariat team. Uh, many of you I see from the attendees list um, have participated in virtual or in-person activities of the Asia LEDS Partnership or LEDS Global Partnership before. So just a very quick background on what we do. Uh, for context, the LEDS Global Partnership is an international initiative that draws support and participation from over 160 organizations, uh, ranging from governments to international donors to technical institutes and other types of stakeholders working on LEDS action. Um, our goal is to upscale implementation of low emission climate resilient development. Um, the LEDS Global Partnership has three regional platforms through which activities are delivered. And the Asia LEDS Partnership is one of these regional platforms. The other two are in Latin America and the Caribbean and Africa. Uh, the LEDS Global Partnership also has a number of technical working groups that provide expertise in support of that activity delivery. Uh, the Energy Working Group is one of these working groups, along with working groups on finance, on transport, and on other topics as well. Uh, as Alex mentioned, this webinar is a collaboration between the Asia LEDS Partnership and the Energy Working Group. We hope this webinar helps to raise awareness on available tools to support you in low emission energy planning and brings to you approaches and lessons learned by peers so that we can support each other in making advancements in this topic. Um, so on the slide you see in front of you, um, these are the two webinars we have held already as part of this series, as well as the one we are holding today. Um, at the end of this session, you'll see links to access recordings from prior webinars, as well as to access a recording of this webinar, should you want to refer to materials um, again in the future. Um, so in addition to this webinar series, the Asia LEDS Partnership is also working on other activities this year that relate to advancing low emission energy planning in Asia. A few that might be of interest to this group, we've published an online catalog of training on low emission energy planning. All training listed are free, quality online training that you can access anywhere at any time. Uh, we also have two upcoming activities. Uh, in June, at the end of the month, in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, one is the Asia LEDS Forum, which gathers about 250 members, and a back-to-back -back workshop focusing on catalyzing finance for large-scale clean energy in Asia. Uh, again, both will take place the last week of June in Hanoi. And if anyone is interested in learning more about those events, please send us an email. You'll receive our email. Uh, coordinates at the end of this session. Uh, we've also released and will continue to publish case studies on low emission energy planning, as well as um, seek and promote blogs by experts on this topic. So one of our uh, guest speakers on this webinar today, uh, Anna, is one of those blog contributors. Uh, so we'd encourage you to uh, read her blogs after this session as well. Um, all right, so all of these materials can be found on the Asia LEDS Partnership website and Energy Working Group's website, which we'll provide at the end of the session. I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, we will move on then. Um, Alex, turning things back to you for a short overview on the Energy Working Group. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, excellent introduction of the LEDS GP that we're also proud to be members of um, the Energy Working Group. I'm going to make this short, uh, obviously promotes uh, low emission and climate resilient development strategies, uh, policy development, the use of tools, uh, help for um, practitioners in the energy sector through uh, very targeted activities. Um, we try to bring people together uh, on learning from each other, uh, exchange information. Uh, we try to highlight and communicate best practices. Uh, we increasingly provide technical assistance uh, to countries uh, or country groups uh, and in most parts this is done really entirely free of charge. So if you are a representative of a governmental agency, please contact us if you need help with low emission development strategy planning in the energy sector. Uh, this is a key component of our work. Um, 
Uh, and then we're looking into enhanced opportunities for coordination and collaboration amongst countries and country groups. Next slide, please. So we're around for a while already, and I'm spare you our history and our successes, but uh, here are some of the, the highlights in 2016. Uh, we are doing all together at least five webinars. Uh, the one that you are part of today, uh, which is a mini series of three uh, webinars um, we've been introduced to already. Uh, the other two we're doing this year will be with the Africa and uh, the Latin America uh, platform on low emission energy, climate and uh, uh, energy strategies, and it will, they will highlight leaders in those regions and what they have done and how they have done it uh, uh, in how they have planned uh, climate resilient energy strategies in their in their countries. Uh, we are involved in uh, more than these two energy trainings that you see here. Uh, we are involved in the Asia Labs Forum and the workshop on catalyzing finance. Uh, for large-scale energy uh, that uh, Sandra already mentioned, but we're also supporting the Africa platform on their energy activities, and we do the same in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, there's two signature projects that I want to highlight here that we're currently working on that I find extremely exciting. Uh, one is uh, a Sustainable Energy and Development World Atlas, which is eventually going to be an online tool that shows the successes that individual countries have had uh, on sustainable energy solutions. Uh, so if you know good cases or if you're representing a country and you're proud to show uh, what you have been able to achieve, then also please turn to us and uh, uh, discuss your case with us. Uh, finally, uh, the NG-led community of practice, uh, which is a pilot uh, community of practice. We hope to do more of these in the coming years on interesting topics uh, on different regions. The one this year is with, together with the Latin America and Caribbean platform on bioelectricity. So it brings leaders, uh, country leaders together with those who are currently uh, designing their policies on bioelectricity and, uh, and have, have them work together uh, in an interactive environment on, uh, the, on their bioelectricity policies. This is my last slide, um, and it's, uh, it gets special attention because uh, the webinar series comes really out of this product, or comes out of the work on this product. Uh, this is the Let's Energy Toolkit, uh, which is available to you through our website, uh, through the general Let's GP website as well. Uh, the Let's Energy Toolkit is a reference guide for well-established Let's planning tools and methodologies. Uh, it currently has, I think, one and a half dozen tools uh, that it presents, uh, what they are, what they do, who has used them, why you can use them, uh, where to find the people who help you to use them. Um, the focus is really on tools that are available at no or, in most cases, really no cost uh, at all to the user. Um, it will be updated and extended this year, um, and uh, I'm glad to say that we've found more interesting tools. It's good to have them, and uh, it will be uh, more than two dozen uh, tools uh, in the new version coming out this year. Uh, so please look up the Energy Toolkit, and if you have suggestions for their, its improvement, then please let us know. With this, I want to give it back to Sandra to introduce our first speaker. All right, so without further ado then, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Anna Rojas. Anna is a sustainable development specialist with 15 years of experience working on climate change, energy, gender, and poverty. Uh, she has worked with policymakers, practitioners, international organizations, NGOs, and grassroots level organizations in Asia, Latin America, Europe, and Africa. Anna is the Gender and Energy Task Manager for the Global Gender Office at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, where she coordinates the Gender Equality for Climate Change Opportunities, Renewable Energy, and Mitigation Initiatives. Uh, welcome, Anna, and please tell us a little bit more about uh, the Gender Equality for Climate Change Opportunities presentation that you prepared. Thank you, Sandra. Um, it's a pleasure to be 
uh, here with all of you. And I apologize if I sound a little bit rusty, but I've had a, a very nasty cold for a couple of days. Um, it's an honor, actually, to be uh, together with all of you, uh, especially speaking about a region that's very close to my heart. And to introduce you to the GECO Initiative, which, is, uh, which stands for Gender Equality for Climate Change Opportunities. Um, this is an initiative that was launched by USAID in uh, 2014 and is fully implemented by IUCN. Um, our goal is to in, um, leverage the advance uh, of women's empowerment and gender equality in climate change initiatives. And in this we have three different pillars in which we're working. One is on RED+, plus, the other is um, on climate change policies in general, and the third pillar is on energy and mitigation. And under this work, um, what we are uh, trying to do and uh, committed to do is to um, engage in conversations that have not necessarily taken place in the mitigation arena. And what I want to say with this is that for the past close to 20 years, there has been an upgrowing discussion in the energy sector about what does gender have to do with energy access. And what does it mean for uh, women and men to have different needs? How can this be translated into better projects and better policies? However, these conversations do not necessarily um, translate to the mitigation sector, in which we see that there is still a need uh, to get the conversation started. And this is how GECO's energy pillar um, has been conceived. As a platform, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, Gecko has been conceived as, first and foremost, uh, a platform of experts that are working in five different uh, groups, which are topics that are not necessarily uh, so well discussed, as I was saying before. Uh, so we have working groups that are, are, are dealing with women's participation in the energy, uh, understanding and identifying what are the uh, gender indicators for the energy sector that are most uh, discussed or that are, are, are currently um, in use. What are the best practices there? Also, one of the topics that we tend not to pay much attention to is what is the gender, what is the impact of large-scale um, energy infrastructure? And even if we're talking about renewable energy infrastructure, what are the social benefits but also the potential social impacts that can be uh, produced by these interventions? And how can we, by um, using a len uh, gender lens, um, increase the benefits or reduce uh, negative uh, impacts. Um, if we go a little bit back first, uh, first, uh, thank you. And this conversations, what we do is that we are translating um, the work of our network of experts and our working groups into knowledge products. And we're conveying it through our green platform, the gender and renewable energy platform, which we have interactive maps and we've collected different methodologies, case studies and activities, but also through the production of case studies and briefs. And if we go now to the next slide, I would really like to talk to you um, not only about the highlights for the year, but also about the special partnership that we have with the Let's uh, GP. Because we've, since our inception also, we've tried to uh, become a source of support technical support in terms of what does it mean to address gender in energy and mitigation. So we are collaborating with different working groups, like the energy working groups, but also the, um, the benefits and communications one, and with the three uh, regional platforms, including the Asia platform. So as um, Sandra was referring before, we're, we're part of the series of blogs of, of the excuse me, of the partnership, but also uh, we are developing jointly case studies uh, based on Asian um, experiences, and together with the Energy Working Group, we are um, providing support for reviewing uh, the methodologies for the energy tool that Alex was uh, referring to, referencing to, and try to also include which are the social and gender methodologies that can be particularly used for the energy sector. And we participate in the uh, steering committee from the Energy Working Group, and we're also providing technical uh, participation at the regional meetings. Um, we would like to, as Alex said, encourage you also to 
um, come to us if you are in need of technical assistance when it comes to gender mainstreaming. We'll be very happy to plug you uh, with um, our experts. And if we go to my last slide, please, um, I would just like you to invite you to join our network of experts too if you are willing and, and, and interested in contributing with your knowledge and experience, please reach out either to me or to my colleague Maggie Roth, who is our communication expert. Um, do check our um, electronic platform for more information. And um, again, if, if you're interested in, in learning more about us, uh, do reach out because the, the work that we're doing right now um, is gonna support either your outreach creation of benefits uh, but also understand a little bit better how gender fits into the energy planning and how it's fitting now into also the climate change discussions, which after the Paris Agreement, um, we can see that there is a bigger push from countries themselves, particularly the INDCs, uh, to address gender in their own climate change planning and, and policy making. And so with that note, I would like to also invite you to, to read our uh, the series of blogs that we put out for a little bit context and give the opportunity for Sandra and Francesco to go more into details with regards to methodologies and experiences in Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anna. And we will be making these slides available following the session. So if any of you weren't able to jot down the contact details Anna provided, you'll have those handy after the session. All right, so I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Soma Dutta, a program coordinator of Energia, uh, the international network on gender and sustainable energy. Soma works on cross-cutting issues of gender, poverty, and development in the context of energy access and on efforts that contribute to women economic empowerment through energy access. Uh, in this area, SOMA has supported policymakers, practitioners, governments, NGOs, and international organizations in project planning, uh, socioeconomic, institutional, and policy analysis, and capacity building. Uh, she works with multi-country and multi-partner program portfolio focused on providing technical and financial support to energy programs, gender and energy research, and evidence-based advocacy. Um, Soma, turning it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sandra. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be uh, speaking at this forum. Uh, I represent Energia, the international network uh, on gender and sustainable energy and I'm going to start with a brief uh, introduction to, to my network. Energia, as many of you know, was set up in the wake of the Beijing conference in 1996. Uh, today it provides an institutional base for gender mainstreaming in the energy sectors. We are working in 22 countries and we have ongoing programs in uh, 12 countries in Asia and Africa on a range of topics. We've also been providing gender mainstreaming support over the last uh, decade or so to over 40 um, large-scale and uh, medium and even small energy access uh, projects spanning over uh, various areas starting with large infrastructure, renewables, oil and gas, rural electrification, cook stoves, and so on and so forth. So um, next. So Energia's vision is uh, essentially to ensure that men and women have equal and equitable access to energy services. We also look at energy services as a means for poverty reduction and for inclusive growth. So it's, uh, that really is what drives all our uh, interventions and activities. Uh, now before I move on to the next slide which is on gender mainstreaming, on what gender mainstreaming is, let me just uh, quickly acknowledge that uh, what I'm presenting today is a result of uh, decades of work and of several individuals, a large number actually to be named here, but I definitely would like to uh, acknowledge Elizabeth Sisilski, Joy Clancy, Margaret Scooch, Sheila Parocha, several other colleagues in the countries and also say that we've been together in this journey with uh, several organizations like the Global Alliance, ESMAP, uh, NORAD, CEDA, the Asian Development Bank, DFID, etc. 
So uh, what is gender mainstreaming? Essentially, the process of assessing the implications of any planned actions for men and women in all areas, at all levels, with the objective to ensure that men and women benefit equal, uh, equally from, in, from energy uh, interventions. So with this definition, clearly gender mainstreaming is more than women's issue. It strives to ensure equality. It contributes to poverty reduction, inclusive growth, and women's empowerment. So what is it that we're trying to mainstream? And what is it that typically left, gets left out in energy access uh, projects? Some of the interconnections that deserve attention are as follows. In energy access, for example, the fact that uh, women end up spending an inordinate amount of time and effort in basic household chores like um, uh, fuel wood collection, water collection, uh, food, cooking food, etc. And these could all be actually uh, uh, improved through modern through modern energy. That is, a, that is a link that gets missed. Another issue that gender mainstreaming has thrown up time and again in rural electrification is that uh, it is not automatic that everybody access is able to access electrification benefits on an equal footing. For example, the women-headed households may be poorer and hence they may not be able to access the uh, connections and so on. And given that they may need special groups, may need special treatment. This was shown in the World Bank's Laos Power to the Poor project. We've also seen it, and Ajia has seen it in its work with Botswana Power Corporation and so on. In uh, electricity infrastructure, we've seen that the negative effects of displacement and resettlement invariably hit women more. So that is another issue that needs to be mainstreamed. That is why we are really making a case for gender mainstreaming. In clean energy, there is increasingly a case for supporting women as service providers in a role which is more, which goes more than uh, being beneficiaries. muted. So um, like I said, an electrification program, it cannot automatically be assumed that everybody has equal access just because the service is available. So that is a diagnosis phase. Based on that, then we need to agree on what is it that the program wants to achieve from a gender perspective. And there could be several layers to this, starting with that a program might, a cook stoves program, for example, might just want to give, ensure that women have access to clean, affordable cooking fuel. And another level of uh, gender goal could be that we want women to be economically empowered using a cook stoves program. A third level could be that we want women to become community leaders and or uh, experience social empowerment by uh, using a cook stoves program as an entry point. So these are different levels. And it's very important to be clear on where we want to achieve because that is what really should determine what activities need to be implemented, um, which is the next strategy, which is the next step of the gender mainstreaming framework, which is to design strategy. Uh, it's very important to build consensus. And finally, there has to be a gender sensitive monitoring strategy. And in monitoring strategy, I just want to highlight two points. Uh, the first is that we all talk about gender disaggregated data in energy interventions. That's important. The other uh, important element is to track outcome level impacts. And we've seen it increasingly in programs like cook stoves programs that what is being tracked is the number of cook stoves disseminated or constructed, but how they are used, what is the adoptability, what is the impacts, etc., are not tracked that well. So then the monitoring strategy is equally important with the final objective of uh, both men and women being able to benefit equally from uh, energy interventions. 
Um, how do we operationalize this? Uh, four uh, sets of activities. First, we call the preparation phase, which is basically assessing the context. And by context, I mean the national context, but also the project context itself, where it's working. The second element of this phase is to assess organizational cap capacity. Very important because we need to be planning activities that the organization has the capability to implement. You cannot, it doesn't make sense to plan a very large gender disaggregated survey if you don't have that kind of capacities in our team. And the third uh, element of the preparatory phase is uh, just assessing gender situation on the ground. On the ground here, uh, I mean uh, engaging with communities because firstly you need to establish the starting point. What is it that the project is trying to improve? There also has to be a reality check that what the project is trying to implement, is it in line with the, with the capacities on the ground? And there are several ways of doing this. You can have a large-scale survey. You can also have a short, rapid assessment that will help us assess the situation on the ground. The second phase of this is the design phase, which is essentially what I explained earlier, to uh, agree on a gender goal and design activities. Typically, this is articulated in the form of a gender action plan. However, it also makes sense that uh, the activities and outcomes and uh, the m and &E framework is actually integrated into the projects documents itself, like the results assessment framework, the LFAs, and so on. So it stays integrated and not, not standalone. In implementation, it's the institutionalization of the process is uh, very important. In many cases, we've seen when we have gender mainstreaming done by external uh, consultants or experts, that's where it remains. So which is, which is why it's very important that the process is led by the team that is actually implementing the energy project or program itself. And finally, uh, finally monitor. Uh, this uh, slide is an example of what I mean by situating the process within the project cycle. So here uh, we are starting with, in the center, we are starting with the project goal. It's an assumed goal of achieving women's economic empowerment through an energy access program. Now with that, with that gender goal then what is it, what activities would uh, it translate to? Uh, as I see it, so this is, this is the project cycle where you can see feasibility, starting with the feasibility studies, moving on to baseline or pre-product launch surveys, strategies and actions, and monitoring. So in pre-feasibility studies, then we would assess the role and uh, status of women in similar trades and businesses and so on. The baseline survey or the pre-product launch uh, studies would actually go deeper into this and identify specific capacity building needs that women have, what kind of institutions can we collaborate with, what is the literacy level, where do we need to hold training programs, um, et cetera, et cetera. The third uh, element, which is really the implementation phase, is, uh, is implementation. And um, so what kind of support is required? Access to finance in case of uh, women entrepreneurs we found is a major bottleneck you need to address as. And finally, to ensure in the program monitoring, the project monitoring, that the gender sensitive indicators are integrated within the cycle itself. So that's what I mean that no standalone processes, but at every stage of the project, of the energy project cycle, we integrate specific steps or specific elements that become a part of the project itself. And that's really the only way to institutionalize it. Uh, these are uh, some examples of the kind of entry points that are possible if you're working on a project that seeks to, um, uh, to achieve women's economic empowerment and their actions can be in four broad areas of employment and entrepreneurship, supply chains, capacity and skill development, and equally important is a whole area of communication, uh, information and monitoring, and monitoring in a way that actually is used for course correction and improving the outcomes of the program. Uh, like I said before, NGIA has been working with a large number of uh, um, projects, energy projects in Asia and Africa, and this slide is just to give some examples of the kind of actions that have been implemented. So um, 
uh, with utilities, for example, with the, power, with the Botswana Power Corporation, we uh, started looking at gender disaggregation of data, of connection rates, who is actually connecting and who is able to actually benefit from uh, uh, these these programs. In some of the clean energy programs, uh, the, the programs have actually included leadership development for women entrepreneurs, which has been uh, fairly successful. And in some programs, and I take the example of uh, rural uh, Aga, the rural support program network in Pakistan, which we, where we worked with the biogas program, they actually started to add value-added services like in biogas, uh, for example. Um, uh, kitchen gardening and uh, pottery and that sort of thing. Uh, just an example from the electricity sector, we've been working with the, uh, with the Rural Electrification Agency in Uganda where they, where they identified as a part of gender mainstreaming activities in several areas starting with construction where the focus was on, uh, on um, uh, local employment and uh, gender targets in local employment. So how do you train women that they're actually able to benefit from the employment opportunities that a construction project offers? In implementation, promotion of uh, targets, but also supporting women to access electrification better through subsidies, through credit, through promotion of productive uses of energy, and uh, so on. And finally, in monitoring, then we are tracking uh, uh, we are doing a gender disaggregated uh, data collection, but also ensuring that this gender informed m and &E is actually used for uh, project design and for cost corrections. So just to sum it up then, uh, I, I keep going back to this, but the gender goal, setting a very clear gender goal is very important in gender mainstreaming because the activities must contribute directly to that. So if we take that as a starting point, then at the most basic level, any energy project needs to ensure that we do no harm. We need to safeguard interests of both men and women, especially in infrastructure projects. However, one could go a step further in gender mainstreaming and set a slightly higher order goal, which is that you want to meet the basic energy needs. And these could be in uh, some examples are in the area of water pumping, so energized water pumping, labor saving appliances. We all know that women spend uh, uh, 12 to 15 hours a day working and many of these are really back-breaking uh, hard hardest tasks and these can be improved by energy services so that electricity for community health where, where women tend to benefit a lot in Africa I, um, I, I know 48 percent of the primary health clinics are not energized and energizing some of these could really improve uh, basic health services for women. One could go further up and uh, have a higher order goal of empowering women. And in empowering, you could have economic empowerment, social empowerment, uh, and some of the ways of doing that would be you can have energy for enterprises, we could have creation of jobs for uh, in the energy sector, build capacities. And finally, in uh, all of this, the real final goal is, of course, that you're empowering women, but you're also increasing the project effectiveness as a whole of the energy project itself. Uh, having said that, in NGIA's experience, there are a few lessons that we've learned. Firstly, it makes sense to introduce the whole concept and process in design stage itself when things are not firmed up, uh, when there is some amount of flexibility to, for new budgets, for new activities, etc., to be integrated into the overall project. Um, you need to adopt a completely flexible and adaptable approach. We've, in some of our experiences, we've actually had to go back to the drawing board all over again, uh, midway through, and do it all over again. The third is, like I said, very important that the gender mainstreaming process is led by the local team. Not just the local team is led by the energy project and not by gender consultants outside. The gender consultants can be a part of the team, but it finally has to be owned by the energy uh, energy team, which is why I also said that it's very important to integrate the whole process into the project cycle, into the project documentation. So endorsement of um, uh, and involvement of senior management has been key. And uh, I also want to say that um, uh, we find many of the activities that you propose, for example, training for women, etc., can actually be integrated within existing, uh, within existing uh, activities. But there are some additional costs also which we must be cognizant of and which is 
part of the reason why we need to introduce, it, it's best to introduce gender mainstreaming in the uh, design phase of a, of a project. Uh, I will end there. This is a list of select resources. This is limited um, uh, to, to just a few, but uh, you can also go to the websites of Energy as MAP, uh, UNDP, Asian Development Bank to get uh, more resources. And I would like to end there. Uh, thank you very much. And over to Anna. Great. Thank you very much, Soma. That was a great presentation. Um, just a reminder for those listening in, if you have a question that you'd like to ask any of our presenters, so either Anna, Soma, or Francesco coming up, uh, please type your question and submit it through the questions or chat window that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we'll address them all at the end of the session and follow up via email subsequently if needed. Um, thanks in advance for uh, thinking through and asking your questions. All right, so our uh, third and final speaker for the day, uh, Francesco Tornieri, has been working passionately for over 20 years in social development, currently a South Asia Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Focal Point at the Asian Development Bank and also previously at the World Bank, focusing on the Africa region. Uh, the importance of energy access for poverty reduction and the nexus between gender, social inclusion, and energy have led him to engage deeply in the energy sector by building strategic partnerships with sector colleagues and practitioners. Um, his group's operating approach in the energy sector is based on a few principles such as that a gender equality and social inclusion approach is necessary to expand women's and disadvantaged groups access to energy and electrification services and uptake of technology, as well as uh, that renewable energy presents new and distinct opportunities to promote women's involvement in the energy sector. All right, Francesco, without further ado, uh, all yours. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me well. I'm kind of new to this experiment, so I hope everything goes well. First and foremost, uh, I do believe that uh, the following presentation builds on the theoretical framework provided by Energia, so you can see the consistency most likely. Just a few clarification, ADB uh, is a lending organization, so we provide mostly loans. So in order to mainstream gender, I think one of the key elements is and remains the buy-in from the borrower, be it Ministry of Power, be it the utility. Therefore, our approach while building on the solid theoretical framework of, say, Energia, really reflects also the philosophy of the team, which is basically to compromise and let the energy sector lead. So gender mainstreaming has to be carried out in a specific organizational context. So you will see very little ideology and a lot of practical compromises in order to get the job done. The Madhya Pradesh loan is one among many others in the next slide, if you can push. Okay, I think it's me. All right. The Madhya Pradesh Energy Efficiency Improvement Investment Program is one of the projects that fits well within the framework of today's presentation. It's what we call a multi-trench facility. It's a very major program. Um, the first tranche of which, as you can see in the lower part of the slide, it's $200 million. And basically was aimed to enable uh, the power distribution company to supply quality, supply 24 hours a day for a beneficiary group of 1.4 million people. So within this uh, framework, you can see that uh, the framework of the loan, there are uh, certain components, some of them very technical, but I'd like to simply draw your attention to what I do personally believe were the key innovative elements highlighted in blue, feeder separation, and a known terminology to me before you know being involved in this project, who had major gender and social impact, and on point four, the emphasis on access to business development services for women market entrepreneurs that this program was able to provide. In the jargon of the Asian Development Bank, we do have a gender categorization, and this loan was categorized as Category 2 as effective gender mainstreaming. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the way multilateral development bank operates, but to me, having a categorization 
like this, quite strictly implemented, was extremely good to leverage support and uh, basically has been useful. An effective gender mainstreaming project is a project which is likely to deliver tangible benefits to women by improving their equitable access to energy resources, services, and energy-based livelihoods. The key characteristic of this project were that basically upon initiative of the team leader and not upon being pushed by the social development team, he decided to carry out a household survey some of the results of which are basically indicated on the right, so very simple, no, you know, kind of uh, rocket science results, but an initiative to go deeper and understand what the real needs of the households, including female-headed households, were. And secondly, the commitment to carry out what it is actually a compulsory element for any EGM or effective gender mainstreaming projects at the bank, which is to carry out a gender action plan. So basically, this was the commitment of the team leader. And as you can see on the right side, the household survey came up with a range of very practical uh, results that were translated by the team leader as end user's interface. He felt that this project had the ability through this end user's interface to deliver multiple benefits and results. And he engaged with that. And how did he engage? He basically engaged by soliciting money, and that's quite rare in development banks, for technical assistance, grants. Now, some of you may be disappointed that in order to mainstream gender, an organization like ours has to basically uh, put on the table technical assistance or grant funds. Personally, I'm kind of uh, used to the fact that in order to mainstream new agendas, such as gender in energy, there is a need to convince the client uh, that we are so committed to walk the talk with, the, with them that we can really mobilize uh, uh, grant resources. And in this case, for the tranche one, was a million dollars. And uh, it was basically used to operationalize the notion of productive energy use and energy-based livelihoods. Notion that maybe to, the, uh, you know, to people, to the audience, may be quite new. But if you put yourself uh, in uh, the shoes of somebody, say, in the Ministry of Power or in the utility in Madhya Pradesh, or actually in the energy sector divisions uh, of the Asian Development Bank, those are quite interesting and new notions. So that's the reality in which we operated at the time. So we brought forward these two concepts, especially productive energy use, which was much sexier than, say, the notion of energy-based livelihood. There was an understanding among the energy practitioners that using energy in a productive way, it's good. It's good because it may generate a greater use of energy. And I think the utilities were convinced that that's simply the way to, to go. So they were listening to us. It was not a difficult task at all to basically work together in the design and later on the implementation of the TA. The targets are clearly spelled out there, uh, 500 women, self groups, and the 500 women, self group trainers, trainers providing business development services, and 20,000 home-based women micro entrepreneurs were trained on efficient use of electricity to improve their businesses. So this is a little bit the scheme that was basically a part of the loan and what we call the piggyback TA. So loan and TA becomes integral part of the same project and get monitored together. So there is no distinction the fact of, but in reality that there is a different financial instrument, a loan plus a grant funded TA. Um, simply building on what Soma was saying, the, um, we have different entry points that we've been trying to utilize in the past. What we call them is traditional and emerging. I think we did a good job uh, in this loan and in others to obviously target point one, which is productive energy use and energy-based livelihoods. Um, the focus on the second bullet on female cadet assholes becomes quite uh, interesting and feasible in the context, uh, say, of India, where we are able to collect baseline information on below poverty line female cadet assholes. So it's becoming quite an institutionalized item when we want to pursue gender or social inclusion objectives. The gender sensitive user education program is particularly liked by the utilities because they see the commercial interest in basically educating users, be them women at the household level, be them 
you know, uh, micro entrepreneurs or women involved in self groups because they see that there is a potential end of the tunnel, greater use of energy. So, you know, potential, you know, better clients, quote unquote. And the capacity building of local women's organization. But what's emerging on the right side of the uh, of the screen, sorry, is basically um, what I call, you know, emerging area we could do a better job on. It's institutional electrification. We should pay much greater attention on schools, hospitals, and including street lighting for the inherent gender and social benefits and impact. The second element is really coming up very strongly is the need to invest in not only the skill development of women, from sorry, skill to semi-skilled employment opportunity, maximize this opportunity. Another opportunity which is becoming shyly, but it's, it's, it's coming, it's really working with the utilities in strengthening, such as the case of Nepal, Nepal Electricity Authority. Uh, we have supported the establishment of a gender and social inclusion JZU unit. So there's a long way to go. And there's a little bit of stronger appetite, in my opinion, compared to the past. So I think we're up for, for more rather than less. Um, process and management tools. Uh, obviously, uh, I think just to structure a little bit uh, uh, the Madhya Pradesh loan, those are the elements on the left side that have contributed to what I believe is a relatively successful project. First, in order to convince engineers and energy practitioners, you must play and a game which is based on evidence. There was the survey I told you at the beginning, then at the project onset, there is a need assessment survey which has to be carried out to very practically see the needs of the beneficiary and target them. So this is actually, again, a very simple uh, tool that was used effectively, in my opinion, notwithstanding the, the absolute vastness of the project area in this large project. The second, the gender action plan, which sometimes in the context of India we call gender and social inclusion action plan, when the client is willing to bring to the table other direction of social exclusion related to caste, ethnicity, we want to go the extra mile and so from gender, which is quite a standard way to engage, we bring the two caste, scheduled tribes, other backward uh, you know, uh, classes, and, and we really go and walk a little bit deeper in the dimension of social inclusion. The Gender Action Plan in the ADB is an instrument which is covenanted, which means it's legally bound, binding for the client, and it is systematically monitored during the uh, review missions. So again, we feel very comfortable with the content, and if we need to compromise on some of the elements, the result is that it is a binding document. Partnership with NGO was an interesting uh, elements of this loan. I think convincing in some political context the utilities of the Ministry of Power that we need to partner with NGO because they are partnering NGOs. It's a challenge and it was a challenge. And meanwhile, I think we succeeded in recruiting a capable NGO able to carry out a range of activity that you can see on the screen. And I think we were quite comfortable with the results. All the rest, I think there are elements that are more familiar with you. Obviously, the last point, uh, having a monitoring and evaluation system, as uh, Soma was pointing out, was clear, was important, we had it, uh, and the NGO was extremely instrumental in ensuring this successful monitoring impact. Here, I don't want to go into through all of the key results, because I am looking at my watch to simply say the results are monitor according to a range of relatively institutionalized parameters within the bank. So you can see human, sorry, this is human capital development, not capacity development. The second point, economic empowerment, reduction of time poverty, voice and rights, and establishment of linkages. Just so in the sake of time, you can briefly look at the economic empowerment, one of the aspects is particularly dear to me. And obviously, you can see that there were extremely practical uh, uh, results deriving from the project. Um, and uh, you can see the numbers for yourself. We are actually doing a case study. But uh, I think numbers speak for themselves in terms of uh, some of the inherent benefit. I wanted to use the remaining minutes to simply draw your attention to the fact that, to me, uh, 
this project is particularly important for the fact that, uh, and here I open a very small parenthesis, one of the difficulty we do have is obviously to convince the borrower to borrow for impact evaluation. So one of our commitment is to carry out at the end of the project what we call the project completion report, which is, as you can see on the screen, assessing the project results, but also the gender-related results according to a range of four criteria, relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability. And if some of you are interested in those, you can obviously search on the web or get in touch with me. But what was a little bit more interesting in this project is the fact that we acknowledge the qualitative information on project results was obviously available and I described to you, but what was missing in order to have a very strong uh, sort of case study and uh, you know really use this project for the future was a very thorough impact evaluation. Therefore, uh, because the client obviously is never willing to borrow necessarily for an impact evaluation, we put against uh, um, uh, TA resources on the table and we are in the process of carrying out uh, an interesting impact evaluation on a range of questions that are there. Does rural electrification improve women's quality of life and empowerment? And the second question is, does skills develop and enhance the business opportunity for women headed on based enterprises with quality electrification distribution in rural areas? So those are the two very elaborate questions that were you know, put together in Pricewaterhouse and Coopers is carrying out a very thorough evaluation. I see all of the other methodology related questions later on. You can see them. If you're interested, it's a randomized control trial. I find it personally quite complex, but it's working and I think we will be able to combine qualitative and quantitative results to really develop a stronger argument vis-a-vis -vis the utilities, the Ministry of Power and the Ministry of Finance that we deal with and my clients, my colleagues here in ADB to really do more rather than less. So last but not least, I was asked by the organizer also to elaborate a little bit on the resource implication because some people may be skeptical who may have additional or alternative potential use. Was the $1 million of TA resources which facilitated the, and achieved the results you've seen the best way to go? And what does it take to deliver this kind of results? Obviously, and very quickly, we got the project design phase. When you got the project preparatory technical assistance, so you got a range of social development, gender specialty, three person months, with very strong inputs on my end in the design and obviously the survey that you saw before. During project implementation, we mobilized a TA implementation team led by an NGO, 36 months, and you can see the composition of the team. It was an international consulting firm who then subcontracted the national NGO to carry out the work. Again, for your consideration and consumption, it is obviously a monetary and financial investment to achieve and basically to complement the efforts of the utility and the Ministry of Power, Department of Power at the Madhya Pradesh level, who basically felt the need to delegate the functions of reaching beyond or going beyond the meter, as we say, to an international consulting firm and an NGO. Again, this is one model and there are many others, but it's subject to different views. Monitoring, we have to participate in the loan review missions, which happen at least twice a year. And uh, constantly monitor the implementation of the gender-related indicators and targets in the Gender Action Plan. The evaluation already expanded on that. Qualitative results are abundant, but it will be corroborated through the quantitative results. So once again, that was one of the experience that builds on a strong theoretical framework, including the information provided by Energia. Some goodwill and some good combination of factors, but that's pretty much it for today. And thanks. I hope I did not exceed my time. Thank you very much, Francesco. And uh, let me start our Q&A session now uh, by thanking also Anna and Soma for your excellent uh, presentations. Uh, and most importantly, thank you really for your important day-to-day -day work. Uh, I believe we, we can all agree that uh, we're not where we want to be. Uh, in the world if it comes to gender equality uh, and, and uh, our sector is no exception there unfortunately so uh, you all doing fantastic work to empower women uh, and uh, and make sure that there's greater equality amongst the sector.
So we're moving on to our Q&A session now. And um, please be reminded that on, that on the right-hand side of your window, you'll find um, on the right-hand pane a little window that's been called questions. And please submit your questions there. We've got a few ones already, but um, please add to those. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you. We have about 20 minutes left for Q&A, so please submit your um, submit your uh, questions there. Um, I'm going to take my right as a moderator to start a first round of questions, uh, and I have really quite many, but uh, to, for everyone, um, because these are exciting initiatives. But I want to start with, in, in, in the order of uh, the presentations, and start with Ana Rojas. Ana, uh, maybe you can, you know, want to start on a, a positive and optimistic uh, note here, uh, and wanted to ask you, maybe you can tell us a about some of your most encouraging processes that you have been uh, a, a part of in, in the Gecko initiative. Thank you, Alex. Um, under the Gecko initiative, I think um, because we are conveners of partners and experiences, um, I think I need to put that positivity in the way that we have been received as a network and as an effort um, because we have been able to to start making this bridge between the gender experts, the energy experts and the mitigation sector. Um, but perhaps if you want me to be a little bit more concrete personally I would like to to bring up some additional experiences. Um, one is uh, working with a project which is, um, oddly enough, also supported by the Asian Development Bank, Sevrita 7114, in which uh, the work that we have been doing in Vietnam, um, training women and men masons, has been absolutely encouraging. Um, the, the, this is a pilot project to increase um, mitigation um, um, projects and uh, bring women and men uh, to the table in terms of benefit sharing and seeing how it is possible to train, uh, pre-train these women so that they can follow up the, the Mason training with the men um, and then uh, become partners in biogas building companies has been um, it's very dear to my heart because what you can see is the change in confidence and attitude besides, of course, the financial gain uh, from these women who now have equal payment to, to the male masons, um, has a, a snowball effect on the community in terms of um, the uh, standing that they have, but also in terms of future generations looking up into the, how you can change roles and how you can open uh, markets. Um, also, within um, putting on my, my IUCN hat, if I may, and borrowing of the work that some of my colleagues have done, I think it is also very encouraging to see how um, governments have been taking up the gender mainstreaming process within understanding their climate change policies. And what I want to say here is that IUCN has until now work on close to 20 uh, CC gaps, climate change and their action plans, in which there is a, a whole um, effort to bring together women's groups, increase uh, their knowledge capacities, and then be able to, together with line ministries, discuss what are the main priorities and risks that they are facing in climate change. And although you wouldn't expect it so much, but I think in all of them, energy, comes up as one of the most important um, areas of work. And to see that this conversation and platform is then later on translated into plans that countries are going to put forward uh, is absolutely encouraging. I think one of the most encouraging things that happened at Paris, and of course we cannot take credit for that, but it's just so impressive to, to see that 40% of countries that have put forward NDCs um, are committing to addressing gender within their policies and within their projects. And 
experiences like this, like the CC gaps, to see them also included in some of these INDCs, already reflecting next steps on how to um, increase countries' capacities, um, understand investment priorities, um, understand how energy and mitigation go hand in hand with ensuring that women and men have access to benefits. To me, that is absolutely encouraging and one of the reasons why I think identifying methodologies and examples like the ones we've seen today are key uh, for moving the gender equality agenda forward. Thank you, Anna. I, I agree that we're walking in the right direction, at least in most countries, uh, but it's still a, a long way to go. Uh, Soma, wonderful presentation, such a great project. Um, I really like sort of the staged ambition that you were showing. You know, this is not just to do no harm to women, but this is, of course, the first step. Uh, and then it is about meeting the basic needs. But finally, it's really about empowering women uh, uh, in order to increase project effectiveness. Uh, this is, I think, a very important part of your, your presentation. Uh, the question that I would have for you is, maybe you can tell us a little bit about challenges that you have encountered in, in your work and, uh, and how you've been able to address and, and overcome them. And the more specific you can be there, uh, the, I think the, the, more in, the, most, the more interesting it will be for our participants. So much. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, okay, challenges, actually the lessons that I presented were all really sort of coming from the challenges that we faced, faced throughout. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, we can take these as challenges or we can even just take these as, uh, as, as things to address. So the first to me is uh, what, uh, what, what several speakers said actually is this gap between gender and energy in terms of people, in terms of the focal point and all of that. So the gender mainstreaming process has to be bought in fully and we need to make sure that the, the energy project um, teams that are implementing are actually seeing the relevance of it. So positioning gender mainstreaming to an energy project is extremely important because you can, you can um, uh, sort of go on about gender empower, women's empowerment and all that which are all great objectives to have but I think it sort of just clicks if you, if you are able to position it in terms of how it can add to the project effectiveness itself. So if you're doing a cook stoves program, why it makes sense that you engage women masons, for what reasons, how it would make the project better, use of stoves, adoptability, targeting, all of that. So that I would say is the first challenge and the solution that how you position gender mainstreaming. The, uh, the, the, the second uh, issue relates to resource requirement is that some of these uh, actions that uh, come up uh, do require resources and sometimes the resources are tied up already. And um, we've had to have some uh, innovative uh, uh, ways of doing that. And uh, in, uh, in Cambodia, for example, we were working with, uh, with the NAPA project on agriculture, water and climate change. And one of the uh, needs that came up was uh, that you can, uh, you can work on uh, irrigation water, but women are really facing a problem as far as drinking water is concerned. Now, this was not in the project framework at all. So in some sense, it was outside of what was possible within the project. But NAPA came up with a NAPA two later and integrated this as a core, uh, as a core component. And this happened because they saw the relevance of it. So I keep coming back to it that it has to be, the positioning is extremely important. You have to be innovative in uh, getting the resources that you need. Um, and finally, the, um, the, the, the capacity. Uh, I, I think gender mainstreaming is not complex at all. It's, it's not rocket science. It's actually very simple. We just sort of need to, um, uh, need to be open towards it and see the relevance of the activities uh, that are in. So in that sense, when I'm talking about capacity building, I'm really talking about the solution to me is to just break down this whole complex procedure, not use too much of gender jargon, but just talk in project language in the, in the language that we're all familiar with. So I would, <laughs> this is my personal um, thing, that I would keep gender constructs and relations and all that with me when I'm talking to a project manager, I would talk in terms of what they are used to and position it in that way. So because like I say, it's, it's not complex at all. So, um, 
Yeah, so, so basically I would say those are some of the challenges and ways to overcome them. Alex? Thank you very much, Soma. Thank you. Uh, my, I can draw, start drawing on the questions that we've received uh, from the attendees. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, those of you who haven't asked a question but have a pressing one, please continue to do so. Uh, Francisco, two, two questions. One, uh, if you, do you have plans to, uh, to extend your product to other countries? Which ones would they be? And uh, if you do so, would you do it all the same way again? Or uh, uh, are, there, are there things you would change? That's the first uh, question. Uh, and uh, the second one is, um, we received a question here, uh, have you started to evaluate the impact that your product has had, not just in economic terms on women, but really in terms of sort of decision making of women, at, particularly at the rural or at the, at the village level. So, um, have women been empowered, have has their standing within these communities in terms of uh, their right to speak, their right to decide, has that been changed? Uh, so these two questions, for this quick, you could answer them. Uh, we have a long list of additional questions, so I'm asking all uh, presenters to be relatively short, but of course uh, also make, make the points that are important. Over to you, Francisco. Thanks. The, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to consider India as a country, so I always have a tendency to consider that as a continent. So Madhya Pradesh is, in fact, a country and a continent. Uh, but the thing is that uh, there is some politics in the way I am operating. And just to give an example, we are, I think, uh, actually with Energy, we did a good job in, uh, on similar initiatives in Bhutan, and Nepal, and Sri Lanka. My objective now is to bring this perspective mostly to Bangladesh, which is one of the countries which is in dire need of you know broader access to energy than any of the other countries as a matter of fact and I think we have a very strong buy-in in Sri Lanka and the, the new Madhya Pradesh is Rajasthan for us so basically Rajasthan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka uh, will be including obviously this also some possibility to do more work in Nepal and Bhutan remains a garden of innovative approaches to energy access it's uh, simply too, too good to be true in terms of the ability we do have to go at a higher level. So I think there's lots of uh, countries there. And by the way, if there's any of you who wants to reach out to me for any potential technical or financial partnership uh, in bringing any agenda forward, uh, we are definitely open in these next six months for listening. On the second question, I was rereading the project evaluation criteria, the questions. And I do believe I was actually even able to call on my team that as part of this Madhya Pradesh evaluation by the end of the year, the broader notion of empowerment, uh, be it uh, you, know, uh, you know, legal, social, and economic, I mean, there will be some uh, results in terms of decision making. So I think it will be broader than uh, uh, economic empowerment. So sorry, I emphasize that because, sorry, it's something that to me trigger all sorts of interesting dynamic, including decision making within the household and the village. But I've been reassured that, that there will be information on that. So through the network and through the energy network, I'll be definitely, this will be very public a document. Uh, so I'll be happy to share it later on. It is a first attempt, and hopefully be partially successful as an attempt. So happy to follow up later on that. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Um, moving on to Soma. Uh, Long list of questions here, but I want to um, put two in front of you at this point. Uh, we have participants asking about specific country context. Cote d'Ivoire uh, has been raised in Pakistan. Uh, it's, it's probably a little bit beyond the scope of the discussion now to discuss each country individually. Um, and I want to uh, uh, point participants to the current slide we have up here where you will find email addresses of all participants. So with your more specific questions, um, also please be free. Uh, all panelists have volunteered uh, or may even you know, pushed us to make sure that their email addresses are provided so that you can contact them directly. But in a, in a little bit broader sense, uh, the question would be for you, Soma. Do you have local focal points within the countries you're working in? Have you set up offices there? How do you partner with people with within the country. Uh, so that would be a, a first question. And the second one was our, our very active participants already looked up your website for resources. 
um, but couldn't find any any online trainings or so. Are you working on these? Are there other places where they should look? Okay, <laughs> that's a bunch of questions. Let me just uh, start start with the first of. Uh, partners. Um, uh, let me just explain uh, in a few sentences how Energia functions. We are, like I said, an international network. We are an informal network. Uh, we are, uh, but we are based in an organization which is, uh, he was uh, international. It's a large NGO based in the Netherlands. So we are housed by them. We are a group of uh, seven people, which is international secretariat. Six of them are in the Netherlands, and I'm, I'm, I work from India. In, uh, in our uh, regional uh, structure, we don't have a regional structure, but we do have national focal points in 22 countries. And uh, out of that, we don't have Cote d'Ivoire, unfortunately. But uh, we do have focal points. We worked with ENDA in Senegal, and we worked with Gratis Foundation in Ghana. And we are also working currently with the Global Village Energy Partnership in Senegal and uh, so on. So, uh, so there are two levels of uh, network members. One is what we call the national focal points. And these are the organizations that I, some of the organizations that I mentioned. And I'm happy to put you in touch with them. Uh, with, with the region, with the Francophone uh, African uh, partners. The other is where we have country programs, where we are actually implementing programs. And we are implementing a program in nine countries on women's economic empowerment. In Africa, we are working in um, Senegal, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Nigeria, and one more. Uh, yeah, and in uh, in Asia we're working in we have country programs in Nepal and in Indonesia. So I'm very very happy to put you in touch with these uh, these organizations because they they're not only focal points; they're also actually demonstrating work on the ground. Um, as far as as far as resources are concerned, you'll see on the website the plenty of resources available. We uh, in our last phase, which was which ended in 2012, we uh, we were doing a lot of training programs, and we would uh, we would love to do more of them. But now, what we've done mostly is to integrate it within our existing other programs. So um, we are not holding um, uh, separate capacity building programs, but when when we're working with an organization like say. Jerus in uh, Myanmar or with uh, practical action in Kenya, then we do targeted, very targeted uh, training programs. We also try and reach out to um, organizations and interested individuals through side events a lot now. So in, um, for example, in Ethiopia we did one uh, at the SNB's uh, um, uh, cook stove, uh, cooking energy uh, program in um, April, I think it was, and in uh, June at the uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum, we are holding a side event which focuses on gender uh, gender actions, and uh, so um, yeah, so those are the ways to access our resources. Please do look at our website. If there's any area of uh, specific interest to you, we are more than happy to design spe uh, specialized, customized uh, training programs for your program, because we find that works better than general basic level. I think the whole concept and discussion and discourse on gender mainstreaming has sort of moved way beyond that now. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for another two or three questions. Let's see. Anna, uh, this question is for you. How do you get the attention of governments? Uh, who do you usually work with? Uh, how do you find your way into the, into the inner circles of, uh, of government and decision making? That's a very interesting question, Alex. Thanks. Uh, well, IUCN is uh, an environment, um, INGO, international um, non-government organization. So traditionally, our entry point is the Ministry of Environment. And under the GECO initiative, we are working um, on climate change. So they are our first entry point. However, uh, through them or, or together with the climate change commissions, we're also able to reach out to other line ministries like the Ministry of Energy. And in Central America, um, under a HIVOS funded opportunity and in collaboration with uh, Energia and uh, OLADE, the Latin America um, Energy Organization, we were able to support uh, work 
in uh, within the en um, energy ministries to um, strengthen their gender focal points because this is something that people do not know but quite a, a good number of energy ministries have gender focal points and the it is important to um, strengthen their capacities and their position and make it visible so that is also another entry point that we've found uh, within governments and we also uh, reach out to uh, ministries of women affairs um, or likewise institutions so I'm thinking um, the Lao Women's Union of the Vietnam Women's Union would be uh, a similar um, institution to reach out to um, to discuss in that case, not so much what are the gender implications, but the other side of the coin. Uh, uh, what ha what uh, does energy has to do with their work agenda? Uh, how does climate change um, interacts or could be brought up into their work agenda? So what we do is that normally through uh, the Ministry of Energy, but not necessarily, uh, sorry, of Environment, uh, we'd reach out to this line ministries and start collecting, um, so creating, sorry, a, a discussion a platform. And when we put together the, we engage in the CC gap process, then there's a steering committee or a, a, a government-led committee that brings together these key actors. So once we have a, a contact point with the Climate Change Commission, uh, with the environment of, uh, Ministry of Environment, then they help us open the doors and start um, having this conversation within um, their national context. And afterwards, we also uh, reach out to civil society because we do believe that they are also a voice that needs to be strengthened and brought into policy uh, decision making. Uh, but our first uh, entry point would be through the Ministry of Environment. Thank you very much, Anna. One more question to Soma, uh, might be the last one we have today. Uh, Soma, you were mentioning uh, that an entry point, an important entry point for women empowerment might, uh, is to design financing mechanisms with a gender focus. Uh, we have the question, what does that really mean and how would such a financing mechanism look like? Can you give a few examples? Maybe uh, a minute or two only, so then we need to wrap up. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I could. I, let me just name two organizations to begin with who've done this beautifully. One is Grameen in uh, uh, Grameen and the whole it girl model in in muted. They're very small and they're too small uh, uh, for regular banks and financing institutions and which is why the transaction costs for them become very high. So the business model has to <coughs> has to ensure that these small requirements are met at the local level. That's the third element. The fourth is informal banking uh, atmosphere. If not informal, at least simple banking uh, loan application procedures. And then information channels that are accessible to women. You know, if you keep information on banks and loans in uh, cities or peri-urban areas, it's just not going to reach the women. So these are some elements I would say that uh, women-sensitive financing mechanisms need to uh, include. I'm not sure if Thank I answered you. your question. Yeah. Absolutely, you did, uh, Soma. And uh, again, I would encourage uh, all participants to contact our panelists or us as the organizers, the Asia uh, Lab Partnership or the Energy Working Group for further questions, also for recommendations, and also, of course, if you want to get more involved with uh, the Let's Global Partnership. We couldn't make it through all questions, and I'm sorry for those uh, that haven't been answered. I'm also sorry to not giving you another chance, Francisco, but uh, take this as a compliment. I think you had a very comprehensive presentation of your very specific case, uh, which, which I find extremely encouraging. Um, you'll find a recording on uh, the website of the Asia Labs Partnership as well as on the Energy um, uh, Working Group 
uh, page. Uh, if you didn't have the time to write this, uh, uh, these links down, just Google them. I'm sure you don't have a problem to find them. We would like you to encourage you also to uh, further disseminate uh, the recording of the presentation. If you like, and send it to colleagues who maybe couldn't be on this call personally. Hopefully, they'll find the time to look it up. Uh, with this, I want to thank uh, Sandra again, our partner in crime here. Uh, I will want to want to also thank my colleague Philip Killeen, uh, who has been helping with uh, setting this webinar up. Uh, thanks to the panelists, thanks to the attendees, and uh, please stay on for just three quick questions in our survey. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.